Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Go show yourself to the priest and offer the gift which Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. Words taken from the gospel for this third Sunday after Epiphany. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. In the gospels, we find that Our Lady, the Blessed Virgin, spoke seven times. In other words, she spoke perfectly. Two times she spoke to the angel Gabriel. At the Annunciation, two times she spoke to St. Elizabeth at the Visitation, one of which was her Magnificat. One time she spoke at the finding of His Majesty in the Temple, which we heard during the Epiphany Tide and Feast of the Holy Family. Son, she said, in part, why hast thou done so to us? And two times at Cana in Galilee she spoke, as we heard last Sunday. And this means that the last recorded word of our Blessed Mother in the Gospel is, Whatsoever he shall say to you, do ye. What does she basically have them do? We heard it in today's Gospel from our Lord himself. Go show yourself to the priest. By the power of the Holy Ghost, the word of God second person of the Holy Trinity, was made flesh from this woman, in this woman, the Blessed Virgin Mary. And keeping with our little series on the sacraments, let's consider holy matrimony once again with Our Lady helping us. As mentioned previously, even while still in his mother's womb, among the very first things the incarnate word accomplished in this world was this. He prevented St. Joseph from divorcing the Blessed Virgin Mary, his wife. His majesty did not let any time pass in preserving the bond of marriage. After some 30 years, the same incarnate word conceived in Mary's holy womb raised marriage to the supernatural by making it a sacrament, making it holy. Even before the word was proclaimed openly and spoken publicly, it's the second of the sacraments instituted by our Lord. First was baptism. The Virgin Mother opened the way for this to happen through the first sacramental marriage, that is, Cana. Shortly after Cana, His Majesty then preached publicly his first gospel. And that's why this Mass today begins with the gospel. He came down from the mountain. He was preaching the Sermon on the Mount. In other words, at this marriage, with its miracle, our Lord's public ministry began. Everyone knows that. Again, this indicates how fundamental to the plan of God is holy matrimony. As you also know, His Majesty's public preaching came to an end on Calvary. As he died upon the cross, the last words were spoken. Among them is this one, one of the very last words. It is consummated. It is consummated. Then the divine word made man, the seed of God, was buried in the ground only to rise up eternally fruitful on the third day. All that remained then was for this same word to be promulgated worldwide so that the fruit of eternal life might be given to us and as many would receive it would be made children of God. To make this promulgation possible, not surprisingly, the Holy Ghost came down once again to overshadow the woman through whom the word was made flesh and later opened made known through her at Cana. The second overshadowing enabled the apostles surrounding her to preach the gospel without fear unto the ends of the earth with great zeal. He would not have come down on those apostles if they had not been around Our Lady. Oh, how important it is to be a child of this woman, to know her 
and love her. She always leads us safely to her son, ever saying, Whatsoever he shall say to you, do ye. She makes the church, the bride, fruitful after the consummation on Calvary. Go show yourself to the priest. Now for edification, there's much to learn here, most notably in how Blessed Mary acted in working with both God and man, acted in working with both God and man in regards to marriage. Of importance is the right ordering of charity in our Blessed Mother. Think about the Song of Songs, the Canto of Canticles. It talks about going down in this wine cellar. It's dark down there. And you have to have charity put in order in that place. What is this ordering that's put in place down there in that wine cellar? She knows perfectly well. For that song is about her, primarily. She, as the bride, the perfect image, and the bridegroom being Christ. Well, she puts the ordering as it ought to be. His majesty, Jesus, is first. She puts others second, and she puts herself last. And if you put all that together, it spells joy, J-O-Y. Jesus first, others second, and yourself last. That's the proper ordering of charity. That's what's going to happen if you go down into the wine cellar, if you're open to it. In saying, whatsoever he shall say unto you, do ye, she does not force our Lord's hand, but refers all to him. She took note of the needs of others, as seen by her calling attention to the lack of wine. But she did not make him serve their needs above his own designs. He must come first. He is in charge. Whatsoever he shall say to you, do ye. He is the bridegroom. The church is the true bride. Now second, we notice how once his majesty has been made known through this miracle, the blessed Virgin Mary, the greatest of all God's creatures, elevated to the heights of heaven with no peer, steps back such that we do not hear from her again. She put herself last. Thus at Pentecost, where she is the central figure that the Holy Ghost comes down upon to overshadow a second time as all true works of art display. If you have a picture of Pentecost where Our Lady is not the center and the Holy Ghost is coming down upon her and then on the apostle, you might want to get rid of that. That's not true. This is the reality. And every work of art that's worthy of that name always has Our Lady in the middle and the Holy Ghost is coming down upon her and going to the apostles. But she nevertheless, even with this great event, her being the centerpiece, keeps to the lowest place. Even though it was only through her that the power from on high descended upon those present. One put it like this. She gives birth to the hierarchy without entering into it. That needs to be said to the nuns and sisters of our world today. Maybe some of those wearing mitres too. She gave birth to the hierarchy, and she never, the mother of God, never entered into it. She said, go to the priest. He must increase. I must decrease. Where did John get that? The lasting and eternal joy comes from putting Jesus first, others second, and yourself last. That's the ordering of charity we need. When we keep to this ordering, water can be changed into wine, tears into laughter. Now, reflecting on what we've learned since Christmas, we know the ordering of J-O-Y is none other than the cross, love of God and love of neighbor and love of self. And this same ordering is very helpful in understanding marriage as God intended it. 
Let us consider two practical applications today. First, it helps us solve a common problem. It's so sad in our times. It helps us solve a common problem many are facing. What to do when a family member, a loved one, or a friend has invited us to a wedding we know is not approved by God or His Holy Church? What do we do? Now, in the old days, they were more considerate. They knew they were doing wrong, and so they off they went and eloped. Well, they don't do that now. Now they insist on inviting everyone to participate in their sin. And if you don't, I'm going to make you pay. I'm going to make you feel guilty for the rest of your life. The gospel today shows us what to do because the first sacramental marriage gives us what is needed for all sacramental marriages to be valid. To put God first and others second and ourselves last. At that first wedding, the mother of God and his majesty, our Lord and Savior, Jesus the King, along with his disciples, were invited. Each of these persons stand for something. The Blessed Mother's presence means the wedding is of the church, according to what she has validly proclaimed to be the form required, according to her laws. The presence of our Lord means a validly ordained priest with proper faculties must witness and bless the exchange of vows. The disciples are the witnesses. Without these three, the church, her minister, validly facultied, and the witnesses, there is no valid wedding for a Catholic, even though the married couples are the ministers of the sacrament. They're the ones exchanging vows. Consent, mutual consent makes a marriage. Priest is there to wrap a stole around their, their hands joined after making the consent and give it the church's blessing, making it a sacrament. It must be witnessed by the church and blessed by her priest. Go show yourself to the priest. Furthermore, the water turned into wine means the wedding is best, most properly made before the altar of sacrifice contracted between two Catholics so that the first thing the married couple does together is attend Holy Mass and receive Holy Communion. This is not possible for mixed marriages. In fact, if you had a mixed marriage, you couldn't even be married in the church, a sacred place, for fear that they would think that you are having holy matrimony, that this is a sacrament. It is not. It's a mixed marriage. The only sacramental marriage is before the altar between two Catholics. Although Protestants are, we recognize them if they've never been married before. And they exchange vows, they're baptized, that's a sacramental marriage. You have to have a dispensation if you're a Catholic and get married with a mixed marriage. This is not good. They used to be married in the rectory as a sign to them. This is not a holy matrimony. It's marriage. We recognize it, but not holy matrimony. Are you sure you want to do this? The wedding is best made before the altar of sacrifice contracted between two Catholics so that the first thing the married couple does together is attend the Holy Mass and receive Holy Communion. All this shows that the couple are getting married to do what? God's bidding. To fulfill his rights and to give him glory. J must come first. In the ordering. Once again, if we go down into that wine cellar, this is the ordering required. To be very practical, here are some things we should do with our family and friends. Tell them now, tell them ahead of time, before they ever get engaged, I will not attend marriages where His Majesty and His Blessed Mother are not invited, as they were at Cana and Galilee. Go read the Bible. You'll see it all laid out. Have you invited Our Lady? Have you invited Our Lord? You haven't? I'm sorry, I can't go either then. I'm a member of the mystical body of Christ. 
Tell them we must serve God first and man second. Even though a loved one may decide to do what they want, at least they now have a sign that this is wrong. Are not giving witness to a, we're not going to give a witness to an invalid marriage. That would be wrong. This sign will remain in their hearts. It'll be a thorn in their side. It is true. But it'll allow an entry point for a future grace of conversion if they're open. The tearful waters of the parents will then be made wine of refreshment when the conversion comes in due time. And if we pray and sacrifice, it will come. Should I go to the wedding? Yes. If the ordering of J-O-Y is observed. If Cana is replicated. If not, do not go. Do not participate in their sin. As hard as this may sound. It is the path of true love, that of the cross. Now, second, the ordering of charity, according to J-O-Y, puts a marriage on the solid foundation of God's love, the love that St. Paul calls the bond of perfection. This is a marriage. This is what it's for, the bond of perfection, but to, to bond with God first. To love and serve God. What must be at the heart of every marriage, God? What is the most important and intimate part of marriage? The answer is love of God. That's the answer. I wonder how many would say today this answer. Would they not rather say the marital act is the most intimate and important part of marriage? That's what we're taught now. And that is precisely... Why so many are getting divorced today. There has been a terrible leveling of all hierarchy in the world. And that includes things in marriage and the family. So let us consider for a moment that intimate act between husband and wife itself. And see whether this ordering applies It does. It fits perfectly. Traditionally, this intimate act has three purposes, hierarchically arranged. Not surprisingly, this hierarchy matches the ordering, J-O-I, perfectly. And thus, when it's followed, you receive joy. You feel joyful. A spiritual joy. Its main purpose is procreation. The generation and raising of children. A couple cooperates with God to bring forth new life. That's why it's called procreation. You're cooperating with God to create a new soul. He makes the soul, you make the body. You want to populate heaven. There are empty choir stalls in heaven waiting for your children to occupy them. What a great honor! It takes three to make a baby, God, husband, and wife. Keeping this in mind, couples should always approach this moment with awe and even some fear, regardless of whether or not they're fertile and able to have a child. This is its primary purpose. God comes first, period. And then comes the second reason. Namely, the mutual love and support the couple provide each other in raising children to be saints. It renews their bond of perfection or being perfected, we can say, designed by God to unite the couple in a common cause. That they have become one flesh and a child. And they are to raise him to take up that choir stall above. God comes first. Other comes second. And finally, the third reason for this act is a remedy for concupiscence. Thus, St. Paul instructs married couples not to stay apart too long, lest one be tempted by Satan and burn with passion. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And this is a legitimate outlet for fallen man. Yet this purpose must come last in the ordering for charity and order it for it to operate And the bond to be perfected, the marriage to last, and joy to spring up, spiritual, heavenly joy. The archangel Raphael explained this to Tobias. 
You can read about it in that book in the Bible, the Vulgate, the Douay Reims, saying that the devil has power to prevail over those who receive matrimony for the sake of lust. For those who put why first, they will have the deal with the devil. That's what he's teaching us. Who always seeks to divide people, this devil, from God and from each other? In order to avoid this, the archangel advises Tobias to put God first in his marriage by spending their first three days together in prayer and to unite his husband and wife only after the third day. Tobias, chapter 6. When the third night is past, thou shalt take the virgin with the fear of the Lord, moved rather for love of children than for lust, that in the seed of Abraham thou mayest obtain a blessing in children, that you may fill one of those choir stalls. Tobias obeyed this advice from heaven. And so we read, Then Tobias exhorted the virgin and said to her, Sarah, arise, let us pray to God today and tomorrow. And the next day, because for these three nights we are joined to God, and when the third night is over, we will be in our own wedlock. For we are the children of saints, and we must not be joined together like heathens that know not God. Tobias followed the pattern of J-O-Y, and the church has loved and honored him ever since. Marriages that follow this pattern do not easily divorce. They produce saints. Not long ago, Cardinal Octaviani addressed these matters during the discussions held during Vatican II. He was trying to counter the flattening of or even inversion of the hierarchy we just mentioned. J-O-Y. J-O-Y. It's a hierarchy. He was trying to prevent its inversion. Many voices were saying the love of the spouse, the O, the other, could take precedence over the J, the primary reason for the act. After the good cardinal explained, coming from a very large family himself, that the hierarchy of the three purposes of the marital act we just presented, he said the following. In the marital partnership, the love that is most anxiously desired so that the spouse's fervor might be steadfast, lasting, and profoundly happy, there's the joy, is a love of conjugal friendship of the man and the woman for one another. All must come before the why for their marriage to remain faithful. He goes on, in marital life and especially in the marital act, there is also a sensory delight that the spouse may desire for its own sake insofar as it is united to a decent marital act and that the other party can desire in the same way insofar as it is united to the same act. In other words, it's okay to have the why, but it must be in the proper place after J and after O. The natural course of things, he said, finishing off, The natural course of things in marital life is such that when one of the spouses notices that the other is dominated by the sensory love of concupiscence, his love of friendship for him diminishes to the same extent. When Y is placed before O, the bond of marriage is under attack. Cardinal Octaviani, thank you. There has been an intense effort over the last decades to make the first two purposes of marriage equal or even flattening the whole out. This effort is nothing but a temptation to come down from the cross, to leave off the seller of charity, the wine seller, a disordering of true charity and the loss of it. The results are plain for all to see. Legalized abortion, contraception, sterilization, viewing of impure images on a grand scale. Divorce, broken families, broken lives, broken hearts, abused children, and much, much more since the family is the building block of society. Our whole country is teetering on the edge. And here's the cause, one of the number one causes. Let us therefore, dearly beloved, strive to abide by joy 
And these evils will be reversed. And to do it well, we're going to need the lady consecration to her immaculate heart. Every married couple, please consider consecrating, placing your marriage in that ark and renewing it daily. May we all be saved souls together in heaven. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.